Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Holiness, a word we often hear, a word we often use, but what is it and how do we become it? Holiness is, as I spoke with Andrew earlier, this idea of being set apart, clean, pure, apart from common, vulgar, dirty. It's actually that simple. That's kind of what holiness means and what it's about. What does the text tell us today about how one becomes holy? You shall be holy. For I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And you will notice throughout the text, this phrase, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, is designed to call your attention back to this phrase. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. So the source of holiness is not you. It's the Lord. But how does this holiness make us holy? As we look at today's text, that should become very clear. <coughs> so, of the 904 sermon files in my computer, this is the first file that I created from the book of Leviticus. And for good reason. Of all the lectionaries that we just spoke of earlier, it shows up three times, twice in year A and once in year C. And two of those are the exact same reading, today's reading. So why so little of this book? The third book of Moses in German. Oh, in German. The dritte Buch Mose. Every now and then i got to try and practice, make sure I know, know how to say a few things. Leviticus, from the Greek is what we call it, for of pertaining to the Levites. So these are, pre, these are instructions and information for the priests, for the nation of Israel, which teach them how to teach the people about holiness. So the reason we do not see much of this book in the lectionary is that so much of it is ceremonial law that was designed to point to Christ. We do not adhere to ancient Israel's ceremonial laws that are designed to point to Christ, to point to the Messiah. That would be like putting up a poster for a concert that already happened. You really wouldn't do that. So, in this book, we get a lot, a long list of things things that can cause God's holy people to become unclean. And a lot of this stuff is described in great, gory, yucky detail. Another good reason we don't spend much time in this book for our worship services. But just as going to the doctor to care for an embarrassing issue, much of what is described as making God's people unclean is necessarily described to teach them and the world around them the difference between clean and unclean, holy and unholy. So even while we are not bound by the civil and ceremonial laws of the ancient nation of Israel, we can still learn about holiness from this book what it is and what it is not. And the source of holiness, which of course is not you and I, it is the Lord, and how his holiness makes us holy. It's described in this book and points to the source of holiness himself, our Lord and Savior, our triune God. The book of Leviticus also contains moral laws. And while Christ fulfilled the ceremonial laws of Leviticus and the nation of Israel, the civil laws that applied to them, 
only applied to the ancient nation of Israel. So those long list of things that you're supposed to stone people for, if they break those rules, we don't have to follow those civil laws. All moral laws, however, still apply. Christ tells us he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And part of that fulfillment is to uphold all the moral laws contained in the Old Testament. They are still there to show, show us our God and show us what it is to be holy, his holy people. Sometimes these laws are in part or in whole, going through the whole thing in some way, civil, ceremonial, moral. How do we pick it apart? A good example that we can use to kind of figure out that whole civil, ceremonial, moral dilemma, if you will, is the third commandment. It contains all three. It contains civil laws in the sense that it was against the law for anyone in the nation of Israel to do anything but honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy on the Sabbath day, which was Saturday. And by the way, violating it meant stoning. Again, good thing you don't have to follow those civil laws. In the same way, it was a ceremonial law. It told them how and when and where. From Friday at sundown until Saturday at sundown, that's the Sabbath day. That's when God's people and his nation were to come together and make his day holy. The moral imperative, however, that we can still draw from the third commandment is that one day in seven, God's people are to gather and receive the gifts that he has designed to deliver his love and forgiveness to us. So that moral imperative still exists. It's not the third suggestion, it's the third commandment. We are to, once a week, one day in seven, spend time in God's word, in fellowship with God's people, receiving God's gifts and reflecting and resting and all of the things that go with that. But we don't do it on Saturday because for 2,000 years almost, the Christian church has chosen its special day to be the day that celebrates Christ's resurrection from the dead, Sunday. I bet you didn't know there was so much stuff wrapped up in the third commandment. Let's examine briefly the laws mentioned in today's text. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. Now what's this gleaning and grapes? This is not about weed and grapes. This information is about how one loves and serves their neighbor. And the one of the neighbors that this is talking about loving and serving is your poor neighbor. Those who are sojourning, traveling through the area and would have need of sustenance. Jesus tells us in Matthew and Mark that we will always have the poor with us. It should not surprise us that there's always people around us who are in need. So that we should expect that if we have we are called by God to share with the have-nots. You shall leave them for the poor and the sojourner, says the text. And why will you do this? Because I am the Lord your God. Connecting us again back to that phrase. This is intentionally connected to that earlier phrase. You shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So because of his holiness... He makes our and declares us to be holy. You can and shall do what God's holy people do, care for your neighbor. This is a declarative statement. It's not a statement that says, if then, it says, this is what will happen. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. We are declared holy by the one who is the, whole, the one true holy God. He declares us to be that. Holiness is placed on us in the same way that righteousness 
is placed on all of those from the Old Testament, as stated in Genesis 15, 6 and Romans 4, 3. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. You are washed in the waters of your holy baptism and his holiness, his righteousness, his death and resurrection are placed on you, washing over you. It's a package deal. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not wear, excuse me, swear by my name falsely, falsely and so profane the name of your God. My word is my bond. When's the last time you heard that phrase? You don't hear it too often these days, but I remember growing up in a world where men said that at least on a regular basis and so did women. And they said it in a way that, you know, really realized that what I have to say is something you could trust. They'd be offended if you didn't trust them. Let's just shake on it. I trust you. People don't say these things very much these days. No, let's lay out a clear agreement on paper so we both know what's expected of us and sign this legally binding document that can later be used to bring you to court if you deal falsely with me because I would never deal falsely with you. Sadly, dishonesty is a regular part of the world that we live in. Stealing, <laughs> deceiving, it's systematic within our society. What they don't know won't hurt them. If you are not cheating, you are not trying. It is only wrong if you get caught. You shall not do these things because I am the Lord. God's holiness <coughs> is the name that you bear. So if you deceive, the text says you profane the name of God, violating that second commandment. This is a declarative statement. You shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. We are declared holy by the one and only holy triune God. Holiness is placed on us when we are declared forgiven by Christ's representative. So carry his name with care and reverence. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until morning. This implies that payday was a daily experience in the ancient world. And we know for a fact that it was, you can remember the parable that Jesus told about the workers coming later in the day and they all got paid the same thing. Daily pay was a regular thing. Now we live in a different time, in a different way. <clears throat> you shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. So in this combined thing about property, we have first to be reminded and remember that we need to make our payments on time. Do not be irritated, the text says, in essence, with the handicapped. Well, I would never be irritated with the handicapped, you might think, but if you've ever been on a council or a committee that had to do anything with regard to adding a handicapped element to any structure, you know that the ADA, American Disabilities Act, is quite a substantial list of rules to go by, and it can be irritating. Know that it is good to love and serve your neighbor even if it is especially difficult you with regard to resources and time to do just that. Keeping off, this, these, this is the kind of thing that helps to keep us off of our own pedestal, putting ourselves up as more important than others, which would be idolatry. You shall fear your God, I am the Lord. Again, this is a declarative statement. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. We are declared holy by the one holy, triune, true God. Holiness is placed on us in the same way that it is placed in our mouths 
when we eat and drink the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You shall do no injustice in court, says the text. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer <coughs> among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. Favoritism and slander are injustices. You shall not be part of them. You shall not conduct injustice. You shall not allow injustice, and you will not tolerate injustice. You shall judge your neighbor rightly. Judge not is a text that's often thrown around, but it's taken out of context. We are called by God's word to judge, but in a way that is pleasing to God, not holding ourselves above others. We are to speak the truth in love and apply God's truth in love and kindness, seeking not to condemn, but to educate and enlighten and redeem. Bring to redemption is the goal of any words of truth that have to do and appear judgmental in nature. Why do we judge with God's truth and grace? Because he is the Lord. Again, a declarative statement. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. We are declared holy by the one and only true holy God. Holiness is placed on us so that we can carry it, cherish it, love it, and share it with our neighbors. You shall not hate your neighbor in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge, vengeance belongs to God, against the sons of your own people. Kindness, frankness, reconciliation should rule all of our relationships. You shall love your neighbor as yourself because I am the Lord. Again, and finally, the declarative statement. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. We are declared holy by the one and only true holy God. Holiness is placed on us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Reflect the wonder of this sweet gift that you've been given in your daily walk with him. In Jesus' name, amen.